Today, I'm trying an experiment. In a few moments, I will be answering the questions that came in throughout the week and throughout this service. It will be a practice in imperfection and serendipity. Here are words from my colleague Krista Flanagan on embracing the unexpected to start us off. A question mark on the page of a notebook. What if everything always went according to plan? At first, we might accomplish more of what we think we need to accomplish, and it may seem less stressful at first, being able to anticipate what happens next. But after a certain amount of time, and that amount would vary from person to person, the once comfortable predictability would become less comfortable and, well, boring. If we always know what happens next, we lose the joy of surprise, serendipitous experiences, and the excitement that comes from anticipating the unknown. Friends, let us gather with an open, curious heart, ready to explore the unpredictable, learn from its wisdom, and embrace its beauty. So let us begin to embrace the unexpected and the unexpectedly beautiful and see what we might learn together. So here we begin this experiment in going off script and answering some questions that came in throughout the week and the service. So the first question I'm going to start with is a series of questions that were kind of related. At what age did you first consider ministry as your life's vocation? What prompted that thought process? At what age did you first consider being a humanist? What prompted that thought process? So one of the things that I think about in becoming a minister is how looking back, the process started a lot sooner than I thought it did, uh, but I didn't really know what those seeds were and where I was going, of course. One of the big moments for me was growing up in a conservative Lutheran congregation and going through the confirmation process around age 13. Um, for that process for me, I resisted a lot of the doctrines and dogma that were being presented to us, but I also researched them deeply and came up with a lot of questions for our youth pastor at the time. Perhaps some of them were annoying questions as a group of teenagers kind of poked and prodded at our, at our catechism questions. But what I came away from that was with was wanting a deeper understanding of what I was signing up for. I was kind of expected to ask a couple of questions, but then just say yes and sign on the dotted line after that. And ultimately I did, but because my mom asked me to. Uh, she said, do this part for me, and then you can decide what you want for your own religious path for going forward from here. And I argued with her about that. I said, that's not what the theological reasons for confirmation are all about, too, which, again, might have been a signal to my want to understand religion a little bit more deeply than we were being asked to in that class. Going forward in college as an undergrad at 19, I became an unlikely ally to local or on-campus religious organizations that were trying to make student groups. I served in student government and at that point was religiously unaffiliated. I'd become disaffected with my Lutheran upbringing, um, but there were several groups on campus that wanted to be recognized as official student groups and there was a convoluted process for getting that done. So at about, I think it was my sophomore year, I became the vice president of the Hamlin University Students for Earth Spirituality, our pagan group. And it wasn't a theology or a religious tradition that I practiced myself, but I felt deeply 
that I wanted to be a good religious ally or a good secular ally to these to this religious community. So when they asked for somebody to help them organize things like articles of incorporation, how to get a budget through, how to become officially a group that could do things on our campus, I said yes, because I thought our larger campus community was better for having this group. When they later asked me to be president, I said no. I said that doesn't feel quite authentic uh, for me to represent this group that I'm not a practicing participant in. Um, and then I began my religious discernment process at the age of 24, which ultimately took five years and three graduate programs for me to sort out that I was, in fact, on the path to ministry. I resisted for a long time the idea that I was going to be a minister. I thought I could be a nonprofit executive director. I thought I could do a lot of good work through other organizations and that that would fulfill that calling, that longing in my heart for what I wanted to do with my life. But at exactly the midpoint through my master's in nonprofit management, I, which I ultimately finished, but it was from then on that I knew the next step was seminary. So the next set of questions I got were about theology. And what these were, were a prior humanist, a prior humanist minister of Buxmont believed in process theology. Does process theology appeal to you? And what I would say to this question is that many Unitarian Universalists find process theology to be the place that they land if they look into the various kind of theories of theology out there. And process theology is the idea that God or the divine is an unfolding process that is impacted by such things as time and events in our reality, and yet is still something set apart from it. So this is similar to something called panentheism, which many UU ministers I know hold with. However, I do not hold that God or the divine is somehow separate or unique from all of existence. I would be somewhere around the, the definition of what a pantheist is, which is that anything we might label as divine is the very same stuff as the universe. It is the energy of atoms, the matter, the antimatter, the dark matter that makes up everything. So the follow-up question that came into this is how would I describe my theology? And I think that the label I would use most currently to describe my understanding about what matters, how we should be, and what it means to live a good life, it falls under the umbrella of a term called religious naturalism which is all about how the natural world existence itself is where we, where we find awe, wonder, and the divine resides there too. So it would be the idea that a good person, what it means to be a good person is to acknowledge our interconnectedness with the world. And not that we are somehow apart from it, or apart from creation itself, but that we are inextricably linked with it, which connects to my primary identity as a humanist, someone who believes in the power of our species to do incredible good, even while we know we are also incredibly, we are also capable of incredibly bad things at the very same time. I have faith in us as a collective force for good, and I have hope that we will get better at living with one another and with the planet over time. So a couple of other questions are, how does our principle of tolerance confront things that we should be slash are intolerant of without being hypocritical? So I think that this is one of those pieces of tension that is both important to think about as an individual. So when we think about who we are as religious people, or when we think of ourselves as moral people or ethical people, all of those systems for thinking about what it means to be good, explore the tensions therein. So it's one thing to be good and just when you're all by yourself, when you're living off the grid, when you're not in community, that is 
perhaps an easier question. It's one thing to live in relationship with just yourself, but the moment you get into a group, whether that group be a family, whether that group be a congregation, whether that group be the larger part of society itself, things get so much more complicated. Um, and that's when both compromise and tension presents itself. So I think when we think, when we explore that idea of how do we hold open tolerance and acceptance, which is our theme for this month, the idea of acceptance, with the idea that there are some things that are out of bounds still, that's where we come down to the idea of covenant, which is that agreement about how we're going to be together and in relationship with one another. And for me, I really look at where are those individual thoughts, beliefs, and actions harming the larger whole to a degree that are unacceptable. And that's a moving target. There isn't a simple set of these are, these are yeses and these are noes. But I believe that Unitarian Universalists are often practicing what it means to live in the gray in between and to live in that idea that we're never gonna get it exactly right. But the idea of relationship and community is that we're going to work toward getting better at it. And that we're making that commitment, which is a responsibility that we each hold. That means that I won't always get my way. You won't always get your way. We're gonna to have to compromise. And I think that's when, when you get into the real challenge and the real power of things like community, religion, morality and ethics. It's when we can't get everything we want or do all of the actions that we might otherwise want to do if we didn't have to take anybody else's thoughts or feelings into consideration. And that's, I think, what it means to also work toward what it means to be a mature person, a mature spiritual person, but a mature person and a mature actor in our world. And it's a messy process and one that is I think fraught with challenges. And I think as we become more and more a global species and a global, globally conscious uh, group of people, um, it becomes harder. And I think that's part of what we're feeling in our larger political and our larger media and our larger uh, communications landscape is that is that tension between how do we get along with everyone when there's such vast differences in terms of what people need and what they want um, across the globe. And I want to pull in the question from our chat that came in too. Um, sometimes the major unanswered questions of the world can become overwhelming. How do you ground yourself? And I would say a few different things about this. One is my primary spiritual practice of meditation is something I use to ground myself, taking some time to be and to try to remember to breathe in a particular way um, and to just hold that space. And kind of connected to that is my practice of taking Fridays as my Sabbath, my days off, where I try most weeks, some weeks things come up, but most weeks I shut down my work life and I just make space for those things around my home and with my family that I want to prioritize some time for. Those things fit into the rest of the week, but I want to hold time and space to just let go of those larger needs and responsibilities and work. You know, I put an out of office on my email most weeks and I try to turn it all off for at least 24 hours. And beyond that, I also try to take time over the summer and throughout the year to take time off. It's something that so many people working in our society are pressured not to do. We're pressured to be productive every waking moment. So I really try to take that time away to disconnect, to reset, and to just play a little, to have some fun and not be constantly thinking about what is that next email that I need to write? What is that next project that must get done? Because those things are never ending and will always be there when you come back. So I really try to hold time and space for both of those things. 
And as we come up on, I'm trying to keep track of my time here because otherwise I could go on. There are many other questions. I'm going to jump to two remaining questions before we wrap up. One is the question that came in in our chat earlier. What is the present status of the UUA relationship with the Black Unitarian Universalist Caucus? What is the UUA currently doing to address how white our denomination is, even while we strive to fight for social justice for all? And this is something that we have been wrestling with as a denomination, uh, even before merger. The Unitarians and the Universalists pre-1961 were working through this for generations. Uh, it's something that America has been working on. But in our tradition, and especially more recently in the UUA, one of the things that came out last year was we have periodic studies that happen denominationally. Uh, and the study that came out is has been entitled Widening the Circle. And it's all about how do we address systemic white supremacy and racism within our tradition in ways that cover a whole bunch of different areas. Those areas are things like worship, but they're also things like how do we organize our, our congregations? How do we find new leaders? How do we do membership and outreach? How do we do religious education for our children, youth, and adults? Um, and how do we do kind of all these different areas of religious life? Um, so the study guide is something that I'm hoping will help us as a denomination really look at a whole bunch of different areas uh, beyond just who's in our who's in our chairs and who's in our pews. What are the demographics of who are members, which is an important part, but is only part of the story. So my hope, looking specifically at Bucksmont, is that next year our Peace and Justice Committee, as well as our whole congregation, is going to be looking at that study guide, that Commission on Appraisals uh, book called Widening the Circle. And we're going to have a kickoff service sometime in the fall, hopefully, when we're able to be all back together in our sanctuary. But we're going to have a, a kickoff service. And then we're going to have kind of study groups throughout the year to look at what is being suggested in that study guide and which of them makes sense for Bucksmont now? Some of them won't, but what are we wrestling with as a congregation to be thinking about that? And I'm hopeful that over the course of next year, we'll be able to really think about what are some of the changes that we would wanna make as a congregation and explore what are the changes happening at a, den at a denominational level too. So lastly, as I wrap up, I got this question, which I think is a good one, and it's really, really challenging. What is your one-liner or elevator pitch when people ask you what Unitarian Universalism is? And this is something that is incredibly challenging. So I was thankful to get it in advance to be able to think a little bit about it. I believe that Unitarian Universalism is a tradition that has decided to hold the whole of existence as sacred and good, while letting our members choose to answer the question of the divine for themselves. Because no matter the answer to the divine, we believe you are worthy as you are right now. And I believe that that idea is something that is, that's kind of at the core of why Unitarian Universalism works at all. In our congregation itself, we have atheists, we have Buddhists, we have pagans, we have humanists, we have Unitarians, Universalists, Unitarians that grew up pre-merger, we have Christians and we have Jewish folks all worshiping together. So this idea that our circle is gonna be as wide as possible theologically, that idea that we are all whole, holy and worthy right now, full stop, no exceptions, but that we're gonna leave the questions, the big questions about life, what happens when you die, what happens, um, what does it mean to be a good person? What does God or God's role in all of this? Those questions, we're gonna leave for you to be able to answer for yourself. We are a non-creedal tradition, but we're gonna work on answering those questions together. You're also, because you're a member of a congregation or a community, required and the responsibility lies there to think about those questions with other people 
in mind. So it becomes a lot harder to answer those questions when you're sitting together, but I think it also makes it so much richer to do so. So with that, it's already been more than 15 minutes. I knew I wouldn't get to all of our questions today. I will be grabbing some of these questions and finding different ways to answer them in the future. But I want to thank you for taking part in this experiment and for being a part of this community and bringing your questions here, whether it be for this service or week to week, month to month, or year to year. I think that this community is made stronger because we are a questioning people and a group of people that want to work on discovering those answers together. So thank you all. And now we will transition to our next piece, which is our hymn.